What is going on everyone? Welcome to another episode of Yammy Noob. Today we are answering as many beginner rider questions as I possibly can, round two. I put out a video like this a few months ago and I realized that it was getting a lot of views and a lot of people were very interested in this long form kind of beginner Q&A forum type of thing that we did. So I went back on Instagram, I started asking folks to send me beginner questions and I unfortunately sent this out a couple hours ago and I, I kid you not, there are like probably like 300 questions on here. So I'm just gonna try my best to answer the first ones that rolled in, some of the good ones that I see that I can talk about and try to avoid some of the shit posty ones if we can and uh, let's have some fun. But of course, before we begin, just wanna let you know, this is our giveaway, Aprilia RS660. This makes a fantastic intermediate motorcycle. If you click the link down below on yaminoob.co or yaminoobmerch.com, you can enter to win by picking up a hat, a t-shirt or supporting us on the website. So without further Further ado, let us begin. All right, first up on the list here, Jeremy Jared Garcia asks, ABS versus no ABS on a beginner bike? This is a good question. Now, I think that ABS is a great thing to have because if you enter a panic brake situation or you find yourself in a situation where you are not sure of what you're doing on your motorcycle, ABS can definitely help. ABS helps a lot in the wet as well. So if you're buying your first motorcycle, definitely look for ABS. However, not having ABS is not a massive deterrent against buying a motorcycle for your first one, in my opinion. I would say if you can find a bike with ABS, that's gonna be better. If you find a great deal on a motorcycle that you wanna get that doesn't happen to have ABS, that's fine too. So that's my take on that. Toko2005 asks, should the bike make a clank sound when shifting into first gear? Usually, yes. Um, you'll notice that every motorcycle has a bit of a different gearbox setup. Some of them make loud sounds when you click down into first, some of them don't. But it's pretty normal for a bike to make a bit of a clanking noise when you put it into first. Ducati gearboxes, for example, are very known for making a very loud clanking kind of sound when you put it into first. So that's no biggie in my book. Cody Mundell asks, how long should I wait to, as a beginner to add a passenger to my motorcycle? This is a great question because a lot of folks get a bike, ride it around for like a month or two, and then they put someone on the back of their motorcycle to show them the fun that they're having as well. However, I think when you put someone on the back of your motorcycle, you are very much putting that person's life into your hands. They are giving you a lot of security and safety and bequeathing that to you so that you can then go and show them the motorcycle and ride around. So you're taking on a lot of responsibility when you add a passenger to your motorcycle. Additionally, having a passenger on your motorcycle is gonna massively change the handling dynamics of your machine, especially in low speed situations, and especially when you consider that beginners more often than not have problems in low speed scenarios. More often than not, the most common drops and spills that occur for a beginner rider tend to be the low speed stuff. It's when you're feathering the first gear and you're trying to hit the rear brake and you're trying to do a little parking lot maneuver, things tend to kind of get out of control and then you end up just dropping the bike in a slow speed capacity. When you have a passenger on the back of your motorcycle, that's gonna add to the drama, add to the weight, add to the difficulty in maneuvering in slow speed. So I would say personally, just as a bit of a rule of thumb, I would probably wait about six months to nine months until you decide to put someone in the back of your motorcycle and be very sure that you are good enough at low speed maneuvers to have a passenger on the back. Additionally, if you want, if you're trying to back out of a spot or do a quick little U-turn, you can request that your passenger gets off the motorcycle so you can position it in the right place and then they jump back on and they get going. That's also a great tactic too. Nicholas Dark 101 asks, how should new riders practice starting and stopping on uphill inclines? So this is a great one. If you live in a hilly area like I do here in Austin, Texas, you're more often than not gonna encounter stop signs and traffic lights in hilly areas. And that can be a little confusing for a beginner rider because when you take off in a flat spot, you can feather the clutch and the motorcycle does exactly what you tell it to. However, when you're on a incline or a decline, your motorcycle is gonna go forwards or backwards depending on if you're up or down, you know what I'm talking about talking about. And basically what you have to do is just basically practice feathering your rear brake from every stop. If it's an incline or if it's a decline, no matter what it is, if you're practicing leaving a stoplight by dragging your rear brake a little bit, that's going to set you up really, really well for when you are on those steep inclines as well and taking off 
and you can go to a parking lot, you can kind of practice those slow speed takeoffs, dragging the rear brake a little bit. It's not very difficult. If you're not too comfortable doing all those maneuvers by dragging the brake, feathering the clutch, and getting on the throttle, you can always just slip the clutch in first gear and just kind of get going. You're gonna roll back a little bit and then get going as you slip that clutch, but you know, it's not bad for the motorcycle to do that. I think a lot of people get concerned about wear and tear on a clutch. However, a clutch is a consumable item, much like a tire or brake pads. Clutches are designed to withstand the impact of slipping in and out of gear. So slip that clutch, drag the rear brake, you should be okay. Stang Mobbin asks a great question here. He says, how many miles before you upgrade to a bigger bike? Upgrading to a bigger bike is such a difficult and personable thing to try to answer for someone else. Only you are gonna know when you're ready or if you're ready or if you want to upgrade to a bigger bike. Sometimes upgrading doesn't necessarily mean going massively up in power. For example, I'm thinking if someone started off on an MT-07 and they wanna upgrade to an RS660, that is an upgrade because this bike makes a little bit more power, it's a lot nicer, it's got tons more feature, and it's just overall a more premium experience on two wheels. However, it makes a little less torque than the MT-07, so it's not always upgrading, you know, leaping in terms of the power ladder in motorcycles, but I think a good rule of thumb is to follow the European A1, A2 full A license guidelines. I think if you spend at least, you know, a year, a year and a half on your low displacement sort of beginner motorcycle, that's gonna set you up in a really great position to upgrade to a larger, more powerful motorcycle later down the line. If you're younger, I think if you're under the age of 23 or 22, definitely wait a little bit before you go and get yourself a 120, 130 horsepower motorcycle, or God forbid a 200 horsepower leader bike or something like that. Those are very serious machines and should probably only be operated by people who are responsible, mature, or a good combination of both and your insurance costs are gonna be through the roof if you decide to get a leader bike at a young age. NV Rider asks, how do you do personal maintenance on your personal bikes? Do you bring it to the dealer or if the bike is still on warranty? So what I do is all the basic maintenance items, stuff like chains and sprockets, oil changes, brake pads, brake fluids, um, the super basic stuff I will happily do on my motorcycle because it's not that difficult. Tire changes tend to be a little annoying and I usually just take it to someone else for them to do. Anything more than that, we're talking valves, we're talking serious you know, engine rebuilds or changes out and stuff like that, um, I will probably take it to a shop. Uh, none of my bikes are under their warranty anymore, so it kind of is what it is. But yeah, I'd say the super basic stuff I tend to do myself, but you know, that's just my proclivities and my ability when it comes to uh, riding and wrenching on motorcycles. David Innes94 asks, not that beginner, but what should we check slash change on our bike apart from the oil and the filter? So my rule of thumb is if you're buying a used motorcycle or you just wanna maintain your motorcycle, um, you should check all of the consumables and all the fluids. So that includes stuff like the tires, the rotors, the pads, the fork oil, the brake fluid, the clutch, the rear brake fluid, the throttle free play, um, you know, anything that can get out of spec on a motorcycle and will impact the fundamentals of riding it, you should probably check and maintain on that bike, including stuff like oil and coolant. Anything that can be dropped out as a fluid on the motorcycle, you should probably give a check every once in a while. However, in your service manual or in your owner's manual for your motorcycle, you will likely see a table that shows you when you should check those things on your bike. Uh, Luigi Loriente asks, does super expensive helmets worth it over the less expensive ones? Both certified. So the only difference you're gonna see in a really expensive helmet versus a less expensive helmet that are both like ECE and DOT certified is the level of comfort, airflow, and features that one helmet has over another. So something like the Arai Corsair X, which is a helmet I just picked up, it's uh, I think an $1,100 helmet. I got a limited edition version. I really splurged. You really don't need to buy something like that. I bought it because I've worked hard and I wanted something flashy and cool, but a $500 or $400 helmet is gonna protect your head just as fine over an $1,100 Corsair 
or even something like an Icon that's ECE and DOT rated. The only difference is going to be the comfort and the features and the airflow like I was saying. So don't feel so bad if you can't spend six or $700 on a helmet. You're not being any less safe as long as those helmets are certified. Michael Guy NN asks, at what point should a new rider consider going to their first track day? This is a great question and I, I love track day stuff so I want to talk about it. But I think that after about a year of you riding, getting familiar with the basics of your motorcycle, if you're interested in track days and road racing and understanding how to ride your motorcycle in a fun and controlled way, definitely go and take it out to the track. Any bike you have can be taken out to the track as long as you've got good rubber, all your fluids are intact on the bike and you're not leaking anything. Um, you can typically pass tech inspection. A lot of organizations will allow you to rent a suit as well. So all you gotta do is show up early, bring your bike, bring yourself, uh, rent the suit from them, have a full face helmet, gauntlet, uh, gauntlet gloves, and boots that come up to your midway up to your calf right here, a full boot, and uh, you should be good to go. So I'd say about a year after you've owned a bike, go and take it out to the track and uh, enjoy. Nico Rune asks, when in mid cornering, suddenly someone from oncoming lane is going into my lane, should I brake or try to lean more? So this is a common one as well, and I'm gonna have to use both my hands here really quick. But let's say you're mid corner, and you're going around a left-hander here, and someone's about to come onto your lane over here. The best thing you can do is just gently let off the throttle and just pick up the bike. Don't touch your front brake when you're mid corner, because that's a great way to just wash out your front end. Um, a lot of new riders, especially on the track, panic break mid corner um, and lose the front end. You don't wanna tap your front brake while you're mid corner if you're not trail braking it in. If you are on the gas in your mid corner, stay on the gas, pick the bike up, don't touch the front brake. If you're trailing it in and you're already on the front brake, you can manipulate the motorcycle differently because your weight is loaded up at the front and it's a totally different thing. But if you're taking a corner, I assume as a beginner intermediate level rider, you're not trailing it in massively and this is street riding, so you're probably not trailing it in massively anyways. Don't tap that front brake because that's a great way to just wash your bike out. So I would say lightly off the gas, pick the bike up and you should be good to go. Young Ledez asks, does the small 300 beginner's bike are the best thing uh, apply when you are 6'3 and 110 kilos? So this is a great question. I see this a lot, especially in the American market where a lot of guys are bigger and stronger and kind of, you know, more plus sized, let's say, than our European or Asian friends across the pond and across the way. The bike that's gonna be best for you to begin on is something that you feel comfortable size-wise on and you feel comfortable power-wise on as well. There isn't a kind of do everything be all end all best beginner bike for everybody. Some people might feel more comfortable on a 650, some people might feel more comfortable on a 300, some people feel like a 500 does great, some people like the 400s. I would definitely recommend for you to go and sit on all these motorcycles because they all fit and feel differently. Something like the Z650 for example, you think it's a 650cc bike so it should be a little bit bigger and you should fit on it well. It's actually very compact and very tiny, which isn't that great for a larger rider. However, an MT-07, for example, has a much wider handlebar and a much larger uh, tank that you can actually more aggressively sit on as a larger rider. You might even wanna look at something like the Versus 650 to start on. That's gonna give you more punch and more power, and especially as a plus-sized rider, you want a little bit more torque to carry you down the road, and you wanna make sure you fit on your motorcycle. Motorcycle fit is probably much more important as a beginner rider than just outright power itself. But as a general rule of thumb, I would still Stay away from anything that has more than about 80 horsepower and probably costs more than like eight or nine thousand dollars. You want to look at the 650s, the 400s, the 300s. Those are your bread and butter for your first motorcycle. So Meto Slim asks how to avoid getting scammed, overpaying, or buying a faulty bike when buying used. So we put out a great how to buy a used motorcycle guide. There's lots of other used motorcycle guides out there on the internet as well. My general rule of thumb when buying a used motorcycle, especially one that I want to own personally uh, that isn't a crusty Hayabusa because I bought that as a meme so don't don't come at me with that one uh, usually it's if it's more than five years or has more than 20,000 miles I normally don't like to buy it um, usually because you can find better deals on motorcycles you can find ones that are less used than that that are gonna work a little bit better and you won't run into really crazy levels of abuse or things that have gone wrong with a motorcycle that is that new 
Also, this might sound kind of strange, but try to buy a bike from someone who's a little bit older. Someone who's older has probably not abused it or wrenched on it incorrectly and probably took it to a dealership and probably owned and maintained that motorcycle in more an adult way. But there's plenty of little things to look for. I highly recommend you check out our used motorcycle buying guide video. That's gonna help you out there. The Winter Sun asks, what are the things you do first when you purchase your bike? Uh, ergo slash suspension settings, et cetera. So that's a great question. So for me personally, when I get a motorcycle and you hit the nail on the head here, I adjust for ergonomics. The first thing I do is make sure that all my levers are exactly where I want it. The throttle free play is exactly how I like it. The brake lever and the shift levers are positioned in the right way. And if I can't adjust them, I will likely buy adjustable rear sets or adjustable foot pegs or levers to get those things dialed into exactly how I want. Because for me, like I said earlier, ergonomics and fit and control on a motorcycle are so much more important than anything else. So if I gotta change the seat out a little bit, maybe a higher seat or a lower seat, if I gotta, if I just gotta fine tune that bike a little bit, that's the first thing I'm gonna do. You'll notice on my race bike, I've got everything dialed in exactly as I like it so that I can ride aggressively on the track. And then you notice on my desert sled as well, all the controls are mapped to exactly my liking. The next step after that is usually suspension tuning. I'll likely set the preload sag to my weight. I'll talk to my suspension guy and see if I need different springs. We'll see if everything's in spec, if we're not putting too much preload. If it has adjustable suspension, I'll likely dial it in for whatever the intended use is. So for example, my desert sled is designed as a 50-50 on slash off-road bike. So I've got a lot of fork dive on that thing, but that's to absorb bumps and stuff when I'm riding down trails and everything. My race bike, I took to my suspension guy and we had set up and dialed in exactly for my size and weight. So ergonomics, suspension, and then from there, I'll usually put tank grips and exhaust. I, I like to do just the very bare simple things to just add to my experience of riding the bike itself. So I would say those are kind of my main things when I buy a personal motorcycle. The giveaway bikes are very different because we have to think about them going to someone who is not own the bike before and so we're not gonna do a bunch of crazy stuff and dial it in exactly to our personal preferences. We usually keep them very stock as they came out of the crate for the winners. So hope that answers that question. Manny Gueva asks, how do you keep your cool when riding with a lot of cars next to you? Sometimes it really stresses me out. Um, that's a really common thing for beginner riders is to feel really stressed when it comes to having cars next to you and flying by you and stuff. And the way I've described it in a previous beginner tips video is that you shouldn't be in traffic just sitting there and having a bunch of cars around you. Because you're on a motorcycle that's typically faster and smaller than the vehicles around you, you should always be making progress as they call it over in the UK. You should be moving through the cars. You shouldn't be just sitting boxed between a bunch of cars. You should always try to give yourself some space between them because all it takes is someone just aggressively stepping on their brakes to have them brake check you or someone coming into your lane. You should always be trying to move out of the way of traffic and being in more open spaces. If you find yourself being boxed in by cars, either slow down and get out of the way and just try to figure out how to get out of the way of everybody because you're on a motorcycle, you're much more vulnerable and you should be trying to find the most exit routes out of that traffic as you can. Now, if you're stuck in stop and go traffic, that tends to be a little bit harder, but hopefully you live in an area where you can lane filter and that makes it a lot easier too. Alex to the O asks, could you buy a bigger CC with riding modes and start with the friendliness setting? I've said this before and I think that's a really bad idea. The reason I think that's a really bad idea is because all it takes is a little flip of the left thumb here and you're in a power mode with 50 or 60 more horsepower on these motorcycles. It's a really bad idea to buy a high horsepower motorcycle and convince yourself that you're just gonna keep it in the low power modes. Um, I, I really would not recommend that because nobody has that kind of sense of self-control and everyone's gonna wanna feel what the full power feels like and then you're eventually just gonna leave it on full power and then you have a motorcycle you're probably not really ready to use just yet. So I think that's a bad idea personally. High Finance asks, does shifting without the clutch hurt the motorcycle over time or will it cause damage? So effectively clutchless shifting 
will not do anything to your motorcycle. All you're doing is just slipping the gearbox as you let off the throttle and the cogs are just re-engaging as they had time to just split and separate a little bit. So it doesn't do anything bad to the motorcycle. The clutch is simply there to allow you to much more easily do that transfer of gears and to get out of first gear as well. So clutchless shifting when done correctly doesn't do any damage to your motorcycle. If you clutchless shift incorrectly, you will probably cause some damage to your gearbox. Georgie Boy says, thinking of getting a Busa as my second bike. Thanks, Yami. You're welcome, dude. Please be safe. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Go Gillespie asks, what's your opinion on throttle locks? I want cruise control and my Ninja 400 is about as fast as I want. So I personally don't really like throttle locks. I've tried one in the past on my desert sled and I just don't like the feeling that something is mechanically locking my throttle into place. Um, I prefer an electronic throttle control because that way if you tap on the front brake, the system cuts it and you're back under full control of the bike. A throttle lock is just a little too sketchy for me in my opinion. I know some folks really like them and have them on their motorcycles and have used them before. However, I just don't like the idea that something is locking my throttle into place. I like having that full control there. So I would recommend upgrading to a motorcycle that has cruise control. The RS 660, for example, I hate to come back to it, but this is one of the most reasonably priced motorcycles with cruise control. So take that for what you will. Uh, Yam Breezy asks, how long did you ride your R3 before upgrading to something bigger? So I rode my R3 for about 18,000 miles and I owned it for, I think, eight or nine months until I upgraded to the Daytona that I had. Um, personally, if I could go back in time, I would probably talk to myself and tell myself to wait just a little bit longer. I would like to have seen myself be on the little bike for about a year until I upgraded to something bigger. And a Daytona probably wouldn't have been the bike I upgraded to anyways, but I have a whole video that I put out that talks about what I would have done differently as a beginner rider. You can definitely go and check that one out as well. Corbin Dietrich says, howdy, I just bought a Cena. Nine months of riding experience. Is it okay to listen to music or no distractions? I think that's fine. Nine months is a pretty good amount of time of experience to just start putting on some tunes on your Cena. Just make sure to remember to stay cognizant and stay focused and stay aware. Don't get too lost in the music when you're riding and stuff, um, but you, you should be okay. Complet Verwert says, every time I shift from first gear into second gear on a bigger bike, it feels like someone rips my arms off. Welcome to motorcycling. It's awesome for that reason. No, I'm just kidding. But perhaps you're getting on the gas a little too aggressively like you used to on your little bike, on the bigger bike. Um, you wanna really, when you're on a much more powerful motorcycle, when you go from first to second, you don't wanna ham-fistedly grab the next gear. You wanna gently grab the next gear and just allow the big power and torque to kinda soothe you down the road. It could also be that you're riding a motorcycle that just happens to be a little bit more herky-jerky. Early generation Ducatis, for example, got that big punchy V-twin. Um, you know, that could be something there, but yeah, just kind of be a little bit more gentle with the throttle, should sort itself out. Diego61 says, can I really not apply the brakes in a turn? So you can, but you have to do them as you enter the turn, and that's a technique we call trail braking. So it's usually not the best idea, as I mentioned before in this video, to when you're mid-corner to just apply the front brakes. That's a very quick way to make the weight balance transfer to the front, you overload the front tire, and you will lose the front grip. I've seen it so many times and in so many videos and on so many track days where someone's mid-corner and they just they just kind of teddy bear the front brake a little bit and just whoop, just, just lose the front end. It happens all the time. Um, the way you can use the brakes in a turn is by trail braking. So that means when you enter the corner, you are already on the brakes and as you flick it in, you let off the brake pressure. So you really should not be using your brakes mid corner. The only way to effectively use your brakes mid corner is to trail something in. So that's gonna be the only way to do it. Beautiful game 225 says, why do we love to ride? Well. It's a great question. Everyone loves to ride for different reasons. For me personally, it's a great release for stress. It's a great adrenaline rush. And there's just nothing quite like being on two wheels. It is just the greatest thing. Yeah, I love motorcycles so much. Uh, Side2R spec asks, why do all the good bikes have to be too tall for anyone under six feet? Um, that is not true. Uh, this motorcycle over here is uh, a great motorcycle. It's a great sport bike. And I think someone at 5'8 or 5'9 could effectively ride this motorcycle. The trick that you have to teach yourself is the left foot down trick. If you understand how to ride a motorcycle, 
by only putting your left foot down and riding the rear brake, you can ride bikes that are way bigger than you would imagine. Because what that's gonna allow you to do is that when you come to a stop, you can lean the bike a little bit over and put your left foot down and keep your right foot on the rear brake. You can find yourself riding motorcycles that are much taller when you ride them like that because you don't need to flat foot them with both your legs. You can simply rest your right leg on the rear brake, lean the bike over a little bit and put your left foot down. It's how a lot of people ride dirt bikes too. Dirt bikes have seat heights that are 37, 38 inches sometimes and obviously very few people have a 37 inch inseam. However, when you sit on a motorcycle, the suspension sags a little bit, and if you lean them over to the side, you can usually get a foot down and plant yourself on that motorcycle. So that's how people who are under six feet tall can ride motorcycles that are a little bit taller in terms of seat height. Rodrigo Sara PY asks, are racing tires worth it for a beginner rider? Greetings from Paraguay. Hello. Um, no, they're not. <laughs> Um, racing tires are designed to go racing or for track days. Even uh, hypersport tires like the Q4, the Pirelli Supercorsa SPs, the really high spec tires, um, you really don't need those for street duty. Those are usually like massive overkill, honestly. Um, if you look at something like an S22, uh, Rosso, uh, Diablo Rosso 2s, that type of tire, that's usually about as grippy as you're really gonna need for a street tire, especially as a beginner rider. Um, more grip doesn't necessarily mean the tire is safer either because a tire can be utilized in many different ways, right? So a Q4, although it's much grippier than a sport touring tire, is actually gonna be more dangerous in the wet for a beginner rider because it doesn't have as much grip as something like a sport touring tire. So honestly, as a beginner rider, you're probably gonna wanna stick to a sport touring tire that's gonna provide you good grip in all kinds of conditions as you get used to the tire slipping. Uh, Mike Esquivel asks, off topic, but can you show a uh, all the riding gear that you use. Um, we have a full video coming out with all of our riding gear that the whole team uses that we're gonna show you guys. So that's gonna be coming out. Recklessly Brown asks, what is better when coming to stop downshifting until full stop or neutral and then brakes? Um, if you're not riding in a competition environment, if you're just kind of bopping around on the street, um, it doesn't really matter. I know people don't want me to hear me say that, but you know, if you're just coasting to a stop sign or a stoplight, it doesn't really matter all that much if you're coming to a complete stop. Personally, what I do is if I'm approaching a stop sign or a stoplight, I'll be cruising on the gas, let's say I'm in third gear, I'll apply the front brake, I'll downshift in the second, I'll downshift in the first, I usually end up coasting, coasting, let the revs fall, and then probably around like three or 2,000 RPM, I pull in the clutch, I stay in first gear, and then I apply the front brake, drag my rear brake a little bit, and I'm at a complete stop. I pull the front brake off, I stay on the rear brake, and usually my left foot is down at that moment, I'm in first gear, and I'm waiting to go again. So I hope that helps, that's how I stop on the daily for normal stop signs and stop lights and that sort of thing. Uh, Smithy Smith asks, is the Duke 390 gonna have a lot of reliability problems because I'm gonna be city riding it? Not really, if you're getting a brand new Duke 390, it's probably gonna be just fine. Father Patrice asks a good question. Is there any way for me to practice for riding two up without an actual passenger? And honestly, not that I can think of. I think the only way to do that is to make sure that you're a confident and good rider in slow speed conditions. And then eventually you're just gonna have to put a passenger on and just give it a shot uh, because there's really no way to simulate that kind of weight and difference in suspension uh, whenever you put a passenger on. Just make sure that whenever you put your passenger on to crank up your preload on your rear suspension just a little bit so you don't bottom out that uh, suspension travel. Chappers Z2307 asks, uh, what is the best way to keep up with others on a group ride? So if you're on a group ride and you're finding yourself having trouble keeping up with people, that's usually a sign that the group ride is either riding too fast or too aggressively or something like that. So I would say maybe find a different group or, you know, if people are riding outside of your comfort zone and you don't feel comfortable keeping up with them, they're riding too fast for you and you should probably find a different group. I personally do not like groups that ride super, super fast on the streets uh, because that's a very, very quick way to get hurt. Gingy Jarvis 917 asks, I've had people tell me to start on a 600, but also people tell me not to. Would a CBR 500 work? A CBR 500 is a much better beginner bike than a 600. I would actually recommend the Ninja 400 over the CBR 400 over the CBR 500, excuse me, um, because the 400 is lighter weight and more fun to ride. Don't start on a 600. I don't care what anyone else has told you. Papa Yam is sitting here telling you to not start on a 600. That's a bad idea. Stammer Gone asks, how do I deal with rear brake lockup? So 
if you're doing it on purpose, you just get, slide that rear skid around and look all cool for everybody who's looking at you. Um, but otherwise, uh, you know, rear brake lockup doesn't happen that often unless you've done something very, very wrong. A great way to avoid rear brake lockup is to not use your rear brakes when you are riding at speed. So for me personally, um, I know this is probably gonna ruffle a lot of feathers, especially in the cruiser community. Uh, my rear brake when I'm on street duty is literally only for slow speed stuff. I basically do not use my rear brakes uh, when I'm trailing it into a corner or actually trying to stop my motorcycle in a meaningful way. Now, a lot of folks might say, oh, Yami, but you're not using your rear brakes. How could you not be using your rear brakes? Um, that's from my track day and racing experience. A lot of guys I know that are really fast on track and probably brake a lot faster than you do use literally zero rear brake. Because when you think about it, when you brake a motorcycle, all that weight is being transferred to the front, so the rear actually is losing traction as it pitches upward. So you can use the rear brake, but all that's gonna happen is like the, this question asker asked, is you're gonna step on the rear brake and the tire is barely making contact with the ground and it's gonna start to skid and then not gain traction. So there's really no point in using the rear brake, in my opinion, when you're riding on the street. Um, and you're not doing slow speed stuff. You're not gaining any additional stopping power and the front brakes do like 90% of the stopping anyways. So don't use your rear brakes and that's a great way to not make them lock up. The other way your rear brake is gonna lock up is if you're shifting improperly, if you're not downshifting correctly, uh, you can catch a, a rear brake, a rear wheel skid as well. So that's a couple ways to deal with it. So Blue Wombat 14 asks, how do you best learn to look through corners to prevent target fixation? So the best way to learn how to do this is to just look as far ahead as you can. You can't fixate on targets around you if you're often looking as far ahead as you can. Um, typically what this means as well as having what we call dead pilot eyes. So your eyes should be very level, looking as far ahead as possible and not averting and looking around in a bunch of different places. When you ride a motorcycle, your eyes should be calm, relaxed, and you should just be, you know, looking as far ahead as you can, looking through your corners, focusing on where you're trying to go instead of all the stuff that's happening around you. A great way to practice that is if you're in a car. Try riding around in a car, driving around in a car, and go through some corners and just practice on looking where you wanna go. Because chances are, uh, the risk of crashing in a car is much less if you target fixate on something. So just practice that in a car, take it to your motorcycle, and it should be good. William Corden asks a very common question here that I've heard from many beginners is, after a wreck, how do I regain confidence in my skills? So after a wreck, you're gonna wanna make sure that you assess what happened, you know, think about what caused you to wreck, whether it was your fault or not, what the conditions were like, what you did on your motorcycle, what happened, et cetera, et cetera. And from there, formulate your ideas that, you know, okay, well, this happened, let's say X, Y, and Z happened, and then you're gonna say, well, I'm not gonna do that again. I've learned my lesson, this is not gonna happen again, and it sucked that I had to learn this way, but I'm gonna jump back on the motorcycle and I'm not gonna do that again. So for example, if you tap your front brake, we've been talking about this whole video, mid-corner, and you wash out the front and you go down, You'll get up, you'll probably assess the damage on your bike, assess your damage, hope you're not too hurt, and you'll think, damn, I tapped my front brake uh, mid-corner, so I'm not gonna do that again, and then you don't. So that's a great way to regain that confidence is just take a very clinical approach to what went wrong and what you're gonna try to do different next time. Um, just because you go down doesn't mean that you're gonna go down again, and it doesn't mean that you're a bad rider. Things happen, and with motorcycles, it's usually not a matter of if, it's a matter of when you have a little crash or a spill or something like that. Uh, so fingers crossed it wasn't too bad and you're doing okay. BHERS03 asks, how do you compare the dangers of riding on the highway versus riding on the street? So personally for me, I found that riding on the street tends to be a lot more dangerous than on the highway. On the highway, everybody's going the same direction, everybody's going around the same amount of speed. Uh, things are much more predictable on the highway. Uh, on the street, you've got intersections, you've got idiots driving super slowly, you've got idiots driving super quickly, you've got people turning into lanes, turning out of roads. I personally do not like riding on back streets and you know little cul-de-sacs in neighborhoods and stuff like that because people tend to drive really poorly. Uh, on the highway, it tends to be a lot safer despite the speeds being higher. Felix Vez Navar asks gear for getting started. So uh, we made a whole gear, how to get started video guide, but if you just want a quick answer on this question here, you're obviously gonna need a full face helmet that's ECE and DOT rated. You can get those for like two or 300 bucks at the very most. You're gonna want a riding jacket, some good gloves, and you're gonna want uh, calf high boots. You want a full size boot. 
Um, that for me is about all I would recommend for a beginner. You can usually get all of that for about six or 700 bucks total. Uh, and you'll have all the gear you need to learn and ride your motorcycle effectively. A lot of folks ask me why I don't recommend riding pants and it's because typically beginners spill at low speeds and it's not really that important to be able to have uh, abrasion resistant pants when you're going at slow speeds. Um, so that's just my take on that. If you can afford the riding pants, they're usually about 150, 200 bucks, definitely get yourself some, but otherwise that would be my recommendation. Man, there are so many questions here. Let's try to find some good ones and wrap this video up. So Spud Hot Potato asks, if you had to compromise on one piece of gear, what would it be and why? And as I mentioned, it would probably be riding pants. I would rather go down wearing a jacket, gloves, helmet, and boots than not wearing any of those other equipment, pieces of equipment and having my riding pants, especially the boots. Do not skimp out on boots. Get yourself a proper full-size motorcycle boot. It is extremely important. Leslie Chow asks, is it okay not to rev match? So there's some schools of thoughts on this. Some people think that it's fine as long as you have a slipper clutch. Some people always rev match. And the reality is I think you should always be rev matching. It just makes the shifts feel cleaner, makes the bike feel nicer. There's literally no reason to not rev match when you blip down a gear. Just Dead It asks, why do I feel way more in control and smooth when I have tank grips? That's because you have an additional point of contact on the motorcycle that has a little bit of grip as well. So that all of a sudden you've got your chest, you've got your leg, you're driving your weight into your outside peg and you're just way more connected to the motorcycle. If you guys are not on the tank grip train, you should definitely get on that train. Tank grips are awesome. Beat by a Tolly asks, uh, what's a good set of tire for rainy countries that are also good for spirited rides? Been looking at Pilot 5s. The Pilot 5 is a very good tire. That's one of the new Michelin tires, it's a good sport touring tire. I'd also recommend the Bridgestone S22. That's a more sporty tire that has a higher silica compound in it that will allow for better wet weather performance as well. So that's a great tire on your motorcycle. Cameron Carson asks, how do I back it in on the street? Come on, man, you know, you gotta bang down those gears and just and send that thing right in there, just chuck that sucker right in the corner and you'll be good to go. If you, if, you, if you gotta ask how to back it in, then you obviously can't back it in. Bobby Y16 asks, what's probably the hardest thing to first learn when you first start riding a bike? Honestly, the one that I've seen the most with beginner riders is balance. Um, I think people just forget that a motorcycle is a lot like a bicycle and you just have to balance them. Um, they work the same at slow speeds basically, which is kind of funny. And um, a lot of people just simply forget their super basic balancing skills. So if you have good balance, you could be set up well to ride a motorcycle. Oh man, there's so many questions. I think we're gonna do three more, three more questions. Guru048 asks 2021 Duke 390 versus Ninja 300 versus R3. Um, I'm not sure why you did the Ninja 300, not the 400, since that's the new one, uh, but I would go with the Duke 390. It's a great bike. ID Coop 28 asks, what is the best way to get into moto vlogging? Just do it. Put a GoPro on, put a microphone on, think of something that's gonna add value to the community, think of something that other people want to know about, add your own personal flair to it, and get started and make some videos. All right, last question for today. Ellington Peacock asks, I've heard people reference a quick shifter and blipper on certain bikes. Is there a difference? Yes, there is a difference. All right, so the differences between a quick shifter and an auto blipper is a quick shifter is a mechanism that interrupts the ignition on your motorcycle's engine in order to slip the gear up. It's a relatively simple system. Uh, you can install quick shifters on your motorcycle. Uh, they can do aftermarket, you have factory quick shifters, and all it's doing is cutting the ignition on your bike and then it allows the gear to slip up. An auto blipper is different. That's a much more complicated piece of technology that usually uh, requires a motorcycle to have ride-by-wire and then you let off the ride-by-wire, the computer knows that you're gonna select a gear down, you tap on the gear, the computer thinks about where you are in the rev, it revs the engine up, and then you're back in the next gear you're supposed to be. So an auto blipper is a much more complicated piece of tech that you usually can't add to a motorcycle as a modification, but a quick shifter, you can. Uh, and this bike over here has both of them equipped because it's pretty sweet. More and more bikes nowadays have bi-directional quick shifters as we call them, but it's really a quick shifter plus an auto blip feature. Anyways, guys, that's gonna wrap up today's video on beginner rider questions. I hope you enjoyed it. If you liked the video, be sure to subscribe. We're trying to hit that 1 million to reveal our Turbo Hayabusa build. It's gonna be a fantastic video. Be sure to sign up to win this Aprilia RS660, and we'll catch you in the next one. See you later.
Hey there, partner. You done made it to the end of this here Yammy Noob video, but I tell you what, there's another Yammy Noob video right over here waiting for you. Now, I know I'm real gracious like that, and I just do nice things for you, so why don't you take a look at this video, and you let me know what you think.